on Express. Hundreds of runaway children survive each night on the streets of San Francisco. They can't go home, they can't find work, and some sell their bodies to survive. Tonight, we'll talk with young people and with parents and social workers who are trying to change the lives of street kids. That's tonight on Express. Good evening, I'm Spencer Michaels. Each year, more than a million American youngsters run away from home. According to the San Francisco Police Department, there may be as many as 1,500 runaways living on the streets of the city. Yet the agencies set up to help these children are severely strapped for funds. There are few special programs and only 30 beds available in city-run shelters for minors. In our studio, we're going to hear from some of those runaways, and we'll talk with parents, social workers, and representatives of youth-serving agencies who are trying to help them. Among them are Ed Sarsfield from the San Francisco Department of Social Services and Margaret Brodkin, Director of Coleman Advocates for Youth and Children. But first, a vivid portrait of what life in the streets is like for one group of runaways, young men who have turned to prostitution as a means of support. The documentary you are about to see contains profanity and includes explicit discu discussions of sexual encounters. The program may not be suitable for all members of your family. Here now, a profile of a young man who ran away from home when he was 13 and found a new family four years later on the streets of San Francisco. I'm on my own surviving. My attitude may seem really different, it may sound cruel or whatever, but being on the streets for on and off for four and a half years, I haven't gotten much. And right now, if I really sat down and thought about what do I have, I don't have jack shit to back me up. I wish there was a way I could just stop going on the streets and just go home. I was 13 and a half. I went to a summer camp and got involved in drugs, acid to be precise. And the counselors there found out and called my parents and said that I had to go home. I was scared to face them. And so I ran to LA and after a week I was hustling and it was like the easiest way to make money. Kind of like a meat market. The men walk around and they check out which piece of meat they want to buy. They talk to the salesman about how much it's going to cost and what they're going to get out of buying the piece of meat. You can't afford you. It's too expensive. I tell you. Huh? I say you can't afford you. It's too expensive. Oh man. Yeah. Who can't afford it? It's horrible. Why is he doing it? I mean, what puts him out there rather than here? To my dying day, he has not been able to explain to me why he leaves. Four years ago, Ian left his home in a comfortable Bay Area suburb and found a new family on the streets of San Francisco, a loose band of runaways surviving mainly through prostitution, hustling on corners, turning tricks to survive. At 17, Ian is not the oldest, but he sees himself as the head of the family and has been on the streets longer than any of the other kids. 18-year-old Beto was raised in Mexico. His 14-year-old girlfriend is pregnant and he plans to hustle to support the baby. Tomcat, or TC, is 17. Like the others, he wants to get off the streets and he's planning to join the army. Gary is the newest member of the family. He ran from home just a few weeks ago, but has already learned the ways of the streets. Ian, Beto, TC, and Gary are not unique. There are thousands of runaway teenagers across America, just like them, trying to survive. 
That's right, bad boys. Don't test me. You can't make it on your own in the streets because adults aren't gonna help you. The only thing the adults want are the male adults and that's what they want is your body. With us, we're all basically the same age. We've all had problems at home and we're all in the streets. And one is a, four is a lot better than one, I should say. Because if something comes up to one person, the other three are right there behind him to back him up. Gabs, let's get go. It's just like being at home, but we're living on the streets. We have no stable place to stay. We go out and hustle for our money so that we can get a hotel. Sometimes we stay on the streets all night. When we started off this family, I should say a group, a gang, really. There were about eight of us, about four girls, four guys. And we weren't really boyfriend and girlfriend, we just had something for one or the other. We, were, we weren't gonna let the girls, 14, 15 year old, 16 year old girls, go whore themselves in the streets. And so we made a commitment to each other to help them out and to keep them off the streets. A couple days ago, I found out Jeanette was pregnant and Jeanette and Bay don't want the baby. She's not ready to have a kid. I mean, she's 14 years old. She's young. She's immature. And there's no way Beta will be able to support it, hustling in the streets. No way. You know what I want to do? <laughs> Just save the fucking money. No more fucking parties. No more spend, spend the money on other persons. Save my money. Put Janet oh, in Mexico in my house mother. I know. Yeah. I know what I'm gonna do. I try to make some cash, get a fucking work. Yeah. And make money for the baby. Right now. I just went back to check on him. He's very stable. He's being sutured right now. It'll probably be another half an hour until he'll be discharged. And you can't go back there. No visitors in the area. So if you'll have a seat over in the waiting room, when he comes out, I'll let him know you're here. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. We went over to Polk, and we were really tired. We were hungry. We just wanted money. And we sat there. Actually, we stood there for about an hour and a half. And Beta was leaning up against the wall. And I heard him scream. And this, this guy, I had heard a bang, and it sounded like someone had hit the wall. And when I looked up, this guy had a black tire span in his hand. And I guess he had just clobbered Beto right across the face. And I ran down to see Beto, and as I was running down the street, all I could see was a big trail of blood. I got down to Cedar, and he was standing there up against the window. Blood was on the window and he looked at me and he just he looked like a helpless kid who had just been beaten up. We're a family, there's five of us. And I just I can't afford to lose any one of them. Two nights ago when I, I went off on an all-nighter, I was seriously considering suicide because I I had nowhere to turn, nobody to turn to. I had a gun to my head. All I had to do was pull the trigger and I would be nothing. Okay? And I realized I had a commitment to three other guys. And without me, they couldn't make it. And so I didn't. 329. It's pretty small, but it'll do. That's my eye, man. Fuck. Oh, look at this view, Beto. I mean, we can see all of San Francisco right here. Check it out. Come here. Look at all the points that everyone's been shooting up. See the points? Fuck you. That's the <laughs> They shoot an arm. They throw them out on the ceiling. I can't. You get better.
I love that fucking shit, man. One, two, three, four of my fucking life. You still got your noodle. Just think if it hit you up here. You could have died. So what? I guess I gotta look it because I get it. You, like my brother. Oh, it's new. Wow. I figure I'm gonna have to make at least a hundred tonight. And at more than 100 tomorrow night, because it's Wednesday night, and it'll be a good night. At least 150. And I will be able to support, with the help of them making their money, us three comfortably. Hustling, it's easy money. You know, if I can put it bluntly, you know, get in a guy's car, you say how much you want, and for what, he'll whack off 50 bucks. That's food, that's a hotel, you know, that's beer. You know, it's some drugs or whatever you're into, but it's money, and it works. You know, I go in and I try to get a job. I'm either underage, I'm either unqualified, because I don't have the high school diploma, or they don't like my appearance. You know, I'm one of the nicest people you could ever fucking meet. There's nothing else we can do. I figure I'd, I'll go off, jack some guy off, or he'll jack me off. 50 bucks, hey, there I got a room, some food. No big fucking deal. It's it. No one's gonna find out about it. I'm not gonna catch AIDS from some guy putting his hand around my dick. I never know if tomorrow somebody pick up me, yeah, and kill me, or for fucking 50 bucks or whatever, yeah, get fucking AIDS for my life. I am not gay, okay? I do something else, but just for money, just only for fucking money, okay? That's really shit for me. I want to tell about my, fir my first trick, which is about three weeks ago. Is that something on there for that? I was so embarrassed, I couldn't even get, get it up. You know, I just kicked back and, and I was really scared. I didn't know what to expect, you know? Here's this 60-year-old this guy or whatever, you know, just you know, trying to get off on you, and you know, it was just really hard. I just couldn't imagine myself doing it. Me, I try to pick a, a, any girl that I'd like to lay, man. I don't, you know, whatever, if she's Probably pretty or whatever. You see, you come to get, man. And I just, and you I just, and I just think of that, you know, and I just and try to deal with the rest, you know. Yeah, some persons are nice with you, and some persons try to get to be, to be nice with you. But they, they only want your sex. <coughs> your sex, your sex, sex. That's all I want you, okay? Your fucking body, yeah, give you some money, and that's it. Yeah. That's the fucking life of the hustlers. But some people, they think another, another people are, are shit. And that's very stupid, because all the people is like you, yeah. Just the difference is the fucking money. Yeah. When I left of home, uh, when my father left of home, he told me the best friends in that life is difficult, difficult to get. But the more best friends in that life you can to get fast is some money in your pocket. Excuse me. Can you buzz me through? I'm here to see Beto Glaze. Can you buzz me through? Thank you. How are you? Te pareces bien. <laughs> Ay, mira el ojo. 
te, se, se te está pareciendo que se está haciendo así. Ya, yeah. tengo un problema con la nariz porque me está saliendo sangre en las noches. Sí. Se me, se me tapa la nariz, me sale sangre para la Tengo que decirte algo, es muy importante. Y tuvo mucho tiempo que pensarlo y todo. Janet perdió el bebé. Está bien, mira. Okay. ¿Cuándo lo perdió? Una semana. Es una semana. Ya, yeah, pero yo ya no puedo estar aquí. Yo ya no aguanto más. Me quiero matar. Don't kill yourself, because listen, it ain't worth it. I can get $500 in, in two days. But I don't to stay anymore, Ian. Believe me, I've been through it. Hey, you fucked up Francis's face. I'm not trying to bitch at you. You made a mistake. You're doing your time. I'm gonna try my hardest to get the money. How are we gonna raise that 500 bucks, though? There's a lot of people. There's there's the three of us. There's TC. There's Jeanette, Katrina, all yeah. them. You what know, are we gonna do? That's that's a lot of people to get 500 bucks. He fucking hit somebody. He's doing his time. I feel for the guy. I really feel for Beto. I really feel for him. But I just... Shit, man. This is what's giving me acne. This one looks good. Al Graf, this is it. How are you doing? Hi. Name's Ian. Hello, how are you? Did what's you... your name, Gary? Monster. Well, yeah, what's your problem? Okay. We have a friend that's over in that building, the unit, the... Yeah, the jail over there? Yeah, oh, and um, he's got a $5,000 bail. And we were wondering if there's any way we can lower it yeah, or if there's any way we can change it to make it a little bit easier for us to pay it and how we go by it. When was he arrested? Um, about a week ago, five days ago. Where's he from? Um, from Mexico, he was originally from Spain, but he came from Mexico and he's been living on the streets with kind of like a family group of kids. Mm -hmm. And he got picked up because someone narked on him for assaulted, assaulting another, a minor. And it'd be awfully hard to get a $5,000 bail for him because if we bail him out for $5,000, we need security for $5,000 and $500. Uh, looking at you, I know you don't have that kind of security and that kind of money. Uh, probably, well, where's his parents? He doesn't have folks. He doesn't They're have back. any parents at all? The, the, he's only got a mother, and she's back in well, Mexico. Well, that's a parent. Well, well okay, well, his mother, Mexico. she's yeah, in she's Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, he's in, he's in a little tough spot. Unless yeah. one of your parents want to sign for him. <laughs> you know. Well. That, that, that takes care of that. I, I can see that takes care of that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, well, yes, thank you, you very much. Help. Appreciate Good it. Good luck thank to you. you. Nice huh? meeting you. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck to all of you. Shit. He ain't gonna get out on no fucking bail. The reason why I ran away because we're having problems at home. And we were seeing a family counselor, and sometimes it helped, sometimes it didn't. Sometimes I couldn't go any place. Couldn't have any phone calls. I couldn't call my girlfriend. My dad didn't like my girlfriend. I just said, fine, I'm packing my bags. I'm leaving this household. Screw it. I'm not going to take this anymore. I can't live this way. I can't live the way my dad wants me to live. He's really my life, okay? He said, you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that. He, sometimes he treats me like I'm still a kid. So what's now? Did I tell you that me and my fiance are getting married in April? No, you said you had a kid. Yeah, she had, she's pregnant, got a stepson, he's three years old. She got pregnant from another dude. 
So there's the one kid. I got one coming in September. Give Yo. My own kid. You got three kids. And I got one. I got this my one step of your kid. Own. My step kid. Right. Hers. Okay. So it's my stepson. I've got one coming on the way in September. Getting married in April. Going home maybe in May. Living with my dad out on the road in a rig. Maybe get taught how to drive it. Well, sounds fun. Yep. Dude, you get dates standing here? Fuck yeah. I never do. I do. You gotta know how to work the corner. Dude, I know how to work the corner. When I stand out in the corner, I kind of think, hey, am I good, am I good looking enough to pick up a trick? Um, are the cops going to harass me? Uh, am I going to get any business tonight? If I do, how much should I charge? What should I do? What does the trick want to do? All sorts of things go through your head. You must be a... Uh a mercenary. What do you mean? A mercenary. No. I mean, you're a mercenary? Is that what you are? That's what I am. Yeah? What do you do? Everything. Yeah? When I look into oh, the I future, sure I see a program. person who's been on the streets for a while, who's hustled, who's know how it is, and who's doing something with his life. Because I want to go to college to get a scholarship and have some pro team look at me and say, hey, that's, that's a good goalie because I want to play. I want to be on a professional soccer team. But if I keep on looking into the past, I'm not going to do anything with my life. I'm always going to remember, hey, I was a hustler on Polk Street. I'm the lowest I'm a piece of shit. Pretty good. You in the military? Nah, I'm going in in August. Alright. Who knows, I may never get off, on this, off the streets. Hustling is not an honorable profession. Like I say, I've said before, I don't see how they can, how, how can they live with themselves. I don't know if you've ever or anybody's ever been on Cook Street at night, but it's very bad what goes on at night. It's, it's really frightening. This is why we've asked the police to come in, because people are frightened to come down here. We get complaints. We have to act against those complaints. It is not the highest priority crime, certainly. The people who are the prostitutes, uh, in my opinion, are victims of the crime up there. Uh, however, in addition to that, I don't think there's anyone who resides anywhere who wants to have prostitution occurring in front of his or her house. Yeah, these are uh, homeless 420s right now. I uh, want to know, uh, they can't go back to Diamond Street House. I just needed a listing for one or all of the other three options they have. Yeah, there's uh, nothing on that one. One of them for females only this time of night. The other one's Huckleberry. The, the, the I'm not going to hook up my house again. They stop taking them at 10 o'clock. Yeah, they make you like, you want spare change and shit. No, they don't. No, who's that? 10 thank you. I forgot, but it's not Huckleberry House. Have you guys been to Huckleberry House yet? I have. What's your problem there? They send you home. But you don't have a home, right? That's right. But we have to think of a solution here. Let's give us a sleep bag, we'll crash it hmm? Pardon? Let's give us a sleep bag, we'll crash it in this You'll <laughs> crash where? On a roof somewhere. It's a joke. Okay, well, cool. I think we're going to have to take a walk down the station house. Figure out what we're going to do here. You don't have any place to go. You don't have anybody to stay with. Yeah, hey, well, I can't, I can't chance getting arrested, so... I mean, shit, I'll leave and you'll walk around somewhere. Nobody's still, arresting you. Yeah, but I mean, it still it comes up on my record, man. They won't take me at all. You don't understand. No, you don't guys, understand. You're not being arrested. Yeah. 
We're gonna have to find some place for you to stay, though. You just can't walk around the streets in the middle of the night. Come on, let's, why don't we take a walk? I'd tell the kid if he wanted to run away, I'd say, hey, look, if you're gonna run away, don't do it. It's hard out on the streets. Uh, it's easier at home. Just sit down with your parents and say, hey, look, we have these problems. Let's work them out. But I ran away. I thought about my dad. What's he gonna think? And how he's gonna feel when he finds out I ran away. We have gone through such pain. You have no idea just to keep your sanity. When a child is gone and he's 14 years old and you don't hear from him and you don't know if he's dead or alive or what's happened. Cheers. A lot of parents that go through this feel enormous guilt. It's a very common emotion. And I've met a lot of parents through organizations that are in similar situations. And one of their primary feelings is often guilt. Where did we go wrong? I can't say that I've ever had enormous guilt. I felt, and I'm not saying that we were perfect parents or are perfect parents, but I know we love him to the best of our ability. I want my parents to realize that I love him very, very much, and I'm sorry that it ended up this way, but I think about them every day, and for the times I miss their birthdays, or Christmas, or Thanksgiving, that I'm thinking about them and I wish that I could be there. And I just, I love you very much, and I just, I hope you understand where I'm coming from. You could sound callous. Why don't you just bring them back with loving arms? At what point do you say, be responsible for your actions? What happened to his self-esteem? Has he no self-esteem? If not, why not? I don't know. I think I got some change. Here you go, guy. There you go. Thank you very much, sir. No problem. Some people are so smug. Their opinion is, oh, if that's what's happening to that child, there's something wrong with that family. Because it's not happening in their family. Well, they should just thank their lucky stars every day that it's not happening in their family. I've gone off with several men that have brought me to their homes and, or their hotels or something and showed me pictures of their wives or their children. I mean, I've gone off with a guy that's told me that I look exactly like his son. And it just freaked me out on, you know, how could they be married and have children and then come and pick up a child like me on the streets and buy him for an hour? I just couldn't ever, ever understand that. Take it easy. No, I didn't. I got the bell. Oh, you are very good looking. What turns you on when you're with the gay dude? We were parked in this like alleyway next to this building. And um, he turned on the radio and started messing around with me and he took my pants off. And he gives me $24 in bills and a dollar in quarters. 24 bucks and a buck and change. Shit buy a fucking toy for that much. It's like most people, they're probably, you know, they'll probably watching this and saying, oh, look at these little scumbag hustlers and shit, you know? But <laughs> if they, if, we're not gonna do this the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. You know, Ian probably might turn out to be a fucking corporate executive and shit, you know? <laughs> I might turn out to be Rambo and fucking, <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> he might turn out to be a gas attendant or something, you know. TC has left town. No one knows where he went. KC was arrested for prostitution. 
Beto is still in jail awaiting trial. His friends have been unable to raise bail. Gary broke up with his fiance and doesn't know what he's going to do. Ian is still on the streets. I'm just gonna say one more time. If there's fucking kids on the street that want to come and go through the life I go through every single day and they want to be paid $24 in bills and a dollar in quarters, if they want to be bought literally for change, hey, I just, I can't, I mean, there's nothing else I can say. Mr. Sarsfield, you're director of the San Francisco Department of Social Services. There's obviously a problem from what we saw in the tape, and the implication seems to be that the city isn't doing enough. Are you really doing enough? Are you doing anything to help these kids? I don't think the Department of Social Services, uh, for the children that we saw in the film itself, uh, I would answer no. Uh, I believe uh, that our policy would be that we would not enter into direct intervention as a government entity. Uh, but if we were to become more involved, that it would be under contractual services. That, that sounds not like it's, it's approaching the problems that are out there. I mean, there are kids who apparently are really crying out for something, and, and the answer seems somewhat bureaucratic. I think that most of our focus, uh, at least it has in the last seven years, has been with abused, neglected, abandoned children of San Francisco. Uh, we serve over 200 children in shelter, uh, have over 100 infants in shelter each month and have probably one of the most sophisticated shelters for that population in the country today. Margaret Brodkin, you're with Coleman Youth Advocates. Mm -hmm. You see how the city operates and you see how the private agencies operate. Is enough being done? Who's, who's to blame if there isn't enough? Well, absolutely not enough has been done. Nobody can watch that documentary and not feel that it isn't a disgrace and a tragedy that children are subjected to the horrors and grimness that, that we witnessed. Um, we believe the issue is very straightforward, that these children are here, that they are, many of him, them have come from home situations where they have been victimized, where they have been abused and neglected. They will, are without parental uh, supervision. These are the children that the Department of Social Services is mandated to serve. And for the last three years, concerned uh, citizens in the community, people representing churches and civic organizations, have been approaching the Department of Social Services and begging them to take greater responsibility for these kids. To this day, the department has uh, been very evasive and bureaucratic in its response and has really abdicated its responsibility to these have very needy youngsters. Have you abdicated responsibility? I don't believe so. I think that the issue that Margaret's framing is uh, whether we as the San Francisco Department of Social Services, who administer state and federal programs, uh, should serve out-of-county or out-of-state youth, and I don't believe we should. All we're trying to suggest is the children here in San Francisco are overwhelming our existing system and funds and staff uh, and that we have uh, the assistance of a home county or a home state. Ian is in our audience and he was in the film. Ian, when you hear talk about uh, agencies and the city uh, and the money and all that kind of thing, does that have any relevance to you? Would, would you use a program if the city or some agency provided it? Yeah, the city does provide agencies like Lock and Street Youth Center or Hospitality Housing and everything like that. But I've been into Lock and Street Youth Center, and um, I guess I wasn't trying hard enough, and I was mostly helping out other kids through my money and through my funds that I made on the streets. And hospitality just never interested me enough to go down there. I went down there once, and they threw a paper in my face, and I said, look for a job. And um, the last six months, I've been supporting about... 10 to 12 kids off the money I earned on the streets with a couple other of my buddies that we make the money with. Um, if I had a, a stable place to stay for at least six months to a year, an apartment that I could share with a couple other guys um, that we could pay the rent and um, some of the money we made, we put into our apartment and everything like that, then I would be more willing to go get a job and everything like that. The money I make every night, I have to use to feed myself, a couple other people, 
and enough to get for a bed. Wayne Smith, you've dealt with Ian and the other and a lot of these kids for a long time. Is this a rap we're hearing, or is there uh, is there a way to to handle this situation? Certainly, what he's saying is the way it is out there and has been uh, for years. The names and faces change. The situation is pretty much the same, and. What he's alluding to in these little family groups where they are helping each other support one another, uh, I think the, the biggest problem these kids have on a daily basis is they never get enough for the tomorrow. Robert Tobin, how, how do you see this whole situation? Well, I see it really as ironic that the director of the Department of Social Services would state that these are out-of-county kids when the fact is that they're right here in San Francisco, and if, they're, and if their houses were in San Francisco, where their parents live, the Department of Social Services would be taking them out of those houses because of the abuse and neglect that go on in it. At the agencies that I work at, we contact par parents immediately when we start serving these kids, and 85% of them tell us, you got the kids, you keep the kids. So you're not going to do a lot of family reunification until you start working with these kids where they are. And the social services are the professionals that should be working with them, not the police long after they've broken laws, or not the medical profession after they've gotten very sick. It's early intervention that is the cheapest, most effective form of care, and that's where it should be coming from. There should be emergency shelters for children, which there are a modicum amount of now. What we're trying to suggest is that throughout the state of California and the United States, that every county and jurisdiction has the same funding that we do. If the families are there, they must, by law, be worked with, not the child individually. I don't know why that's so difficult for people to understand. Margaret? I think the thing that's difficult for people to understand is that the kids are here they're not going back home, at least for now. What the department has done, we feel, is really hide behind some legal technicalities that uh, uh, only deal with a very small segment of the services. Why that these would they want to hide need. behind anything, though? I mean, they're they're obviously dedicated to, to doing a job and, and helping the populace. Well, these kids are very difficult to reach in a lot of uh, situations, as Ian described. It's taken him a long time to finally get to a point where he would accept some kind of services. There are new services for the department. The department is, by its nature, a, a city bureaucracy. It's hard for bureaucracies to change. It's hard for staff to get trained to reach out to a different kind of population of kids. There are all kinds of reasons why. Apparently the, the Larkin Street uh, shelter and, and center has uh, does reach out. Jed Emerson is with that center. What, what do you do? What are you trying to do? The outreach workers for our program go out on the street and engage the kids there uh, while they're hanging out and getting involved in the various things that Ian was describing in the film. They talk to them and try to develop a relationship of trust. I mean, the point that really has to be dealt with here is kids don't run away from home to turn around and go into a shelter program or go back home again immediately, right? It's a process that has to be worked over. And so the outreach workers will work with kids on the street, will talk to them about, you know, are you getting enough to eat? Uh, do you need some food vouchers? Would you like to come into the clinic? It looks like you have a cold. To start trying to develop some sort of rapport with the street youth. And w what, is the, what is the point of, of establishing the rapport? The kids are still out on the street hustling. Well, some kids are, but we do have a good success rate in terms of um, diverting the kids from the street into the shelter program. So the real problem we have is that when you have kids who do commit to getting off the street, they go through our shelter care system, and we don't have the long-term uh, solutions that these kids really need, so they drop out the back end. And it's... It's difficult for us to see this happen to the kids because we do start to work with them and we don't have anything more to offer them. We need a whole range of services, not just one program in the Polk Street area, but the absence of appropriate services then forces kids into criminal activity. So by that absence, we are really criminalizing uh, many of these kids and the longer they stay uh, on the street because of the absence of appropriate services, the more involved in a criminal subculture they become. Paul Seidler with the San Francisco Police Department. Are these kids criminals? I think they're victims. I think the, they, the families, are all victims. Uh, we've been dealing with this problem on Polk Street for 20 years now. I mean, and I'm just wondering how many times we're going to have to reinvent the wheel to make sure it works. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You say the kids are victims, and yet the San Francisco Police Department is arresting some of these kids. Because the community, the business community, the community at large, is coming to the police department as it does with many other things, as a stopgap measure to, okay, what are you going to do? I've called all these other folks to try and get something done, and nobody else will respond to the problem, 
So I'm calling you, the police department. It's a criminal activity. Now you do something. Our hands are then tied, and we have to do something. Maureen O'Rourke. I, I represent the Polk District Merchants Association, and what, what we're seeing, what we're hearing here really illustrates what we have asked the mayor to help us resolve, and that is there are a lot of agencies that really care. The police department has been cooperative. Everybody's working, but they're not working together with the same point of view. And we have asked the mayor, and she has agreed to put together a Polk Street Task Force with the sole task of coming up with a unified San Francisco point of view. And the other thing that I really found is nobody believes that the Polk Street problem can be solved. And believability is a lot of getting it done. Pat so Rocco. I have a question for Ian. You had mentioned about the, uh, the money that's made. Um, if, um, if a job were offered, how many of the people you know that you've talked to would take a job that perhaps is going to pay considerably less than what you're making on the street? Would they, are there, is there enough of a percentage that you believe would want to get off the street and get into a mainstream kind of job as opposed to staying with it and making uh, pretty good money? Um, well, it's, that's a really hard question to answer because a lot of the kids say yes. I'd be willing to do it. Um, I have done it before. And, but the thing is, a kid goes for a certain amount of time tries and um, the boss gives him a little bit of shit or whatever, excuse my language, but he just gets too crazy for him. And he, he, he resolves back to the streets and he goes, well, listen, I made, you know, 60 bucks in an hour. Why should I come here and make 350 an hour? And so he says, hey, later, boss, I'm going back to work. And that's what I did. Let me, tell, let, me, let me bring up a, a subject that uh, touched on briefly, and that's, that's the whole health question. Nikki Collins is with Larkin Street and you're a doctor. Um, you'd think the AIDS situation would change the complexion of the whole homeless uh, scene in San Francisco. Has it made a difference? What's happening? Not really. One of the problems is, is that when you're worried about shelter and food, you don't have time to think about long term what's going to happen to your body. We see a lot of the kids in the, in the cl medical clinic at Larkin Street, and we can talk to them about AIDS, about venereal disease, about um, using drugs, about what happens to them when they're on the street and they get traumatized, like the gentleman in the documentary, but they can't think in those terms because that's long, that's a long way off. What you need to, is tonight shelter and food, and you don't have time sometimes to think about, well, in six months to five years, I might become antibody positive. Now, that some, of the, some of the kids that are a little bit older, a little bit more mature, we've been able to work with. We have um, a young man named Ernest Andrews who was working with us at Larkin Street who did some AIDS counseling, and he was able to turn some people over get them to use condoms, use safe sex. But that's very difficult if you don't have food and shelter. Well, it would seem to me that with the AIDS epidemic as terrifying and as horrible as it is in this city, you are probably one of the few people, a few medical people in the whole world who has contact with all of these kids. What do you personally do about it? Can't you do something yourself or get the city health department in? Now, this sounds like a real serious situation. Well, it's been very difficult. What we try to do is educate the kids that we see at Larkin Street. We also see kids from Hospitality House and from Diamond Street Youth Shelter. And then just some kids who come off the street that are sick. And with all of them, we try to do education against venereal diseases. But it's very difficult to get other agencies, especially the government, to fund services for youth. People don't look at youth. They don't look at prevention. They look at the people that are older, that are already sick, and who vote. And that's where the money goes. It doesn't go to the youth. KC, you hear this. How does the AIDS situation impact what's going on among your friends? It scares me. <laughs> um, but it's like what she said, I don't really think about it. You know, unfortunately, the closest I've got is probably mono, a sore throat. You know, I think I've been really lucky. But um, there's people out there, people that you really wouldn't expect it that have AIDS. It's out there. And you just sort of Say the heck with it. You just ignore it, sir. No, I um, I, I try to use safe sex. I've got a little card that I carry around, and, you know, I, that I got from Martin Street. So is there really any such thing as safe sex when you're in a prostitute type, yeah, type there situation? Yeah, there is. Yes, sir. Um, my, my name is Michael Rosarian. Basically, Did you I've, stand up, Michael. Oh, yeah. I went through Larkin Street, Hospitality, and Diamond Street. And I want to just say that the program works. I work now. And the program works if you let it work for you. 
if you take everything that these people want to give to you. Yeah, but who does that? I mean, it sounds like a lot of people are kind of rejecting what's going on at Larkin Street. Well, if you make the program work for yourself, if you go in there as a teenager and want to get off the street and do what you have to do, you know, the program will work for you. I'm successful now in my community because I felt that I wanted to make the change and get off the street life, okay? You know, so it's... Yeah. I think you have to recognize that these agencies end up doing triage. I mean, there's only so many people that you're allowed to serve with the amount of dollars you have. There's not enough. You, you said yourself, there's 30 beds for over 1,000 kids. How do you decide as an agency provider who gets that service and who doesn't? When there's kids waiting for that service and there's you know, kids that you can't even get to yet who need that service. And I think those are the facts that people need to deal with, particularly people in responsible public positions that are responsible for the delivery of these services and for the care of these children. What about the parents? Uh, Anne Morell is in the audience. Uh, you have a, a child who ran away from home. Uh, what do you, do you feel responsible? Are you the person who people should look at in this case? Uh, I think we as parents have been put in a precarious position. Uh, my son uh, has been well, run away since he was 13, uh, on and off. And How old is he now? He is 16. And um, one of the hard things I find uh, among the kids is that there's no place for them to go. If they run away from home, then uh, they can go to an, uh, a hostel and they stay there uh, in two days and then they're back on the street. We come and get him and then he runs away again. And then the problem that I see is they're slipping through the cracks. The, the kids uh, will get picked up by the police and they get sent to juvenile hall. They, they're, they're not a criminal. So they get put back out on the street again, unless you want to, you know, find some criminal uh, 602 on the child. So he's back uh, on the street or on probation now, and then at home again. And parents work, or I quit my job for two years, and I just stayed home. But we chased him around all the time. So there was no way to to monitor this child, and no help anywhere. I've been through every eight. I mean, every, what do you mean, no place. hope? Well, hope. There's hope. I'm here. But no some. help help, you go through tough love, you can go through, I've talked to uh, probation officers who are very committed to these kids, and they see them again out on the street two weeks later. You talk to the police department, the vice squad, uh, all the um, counseling agencies, I've been through all of them, and none of them know about each other, and they're all giving this uh, rhetoric like they think they know the answers, and there's no, there's no one, the kids are literally slipping through the cracks. I have an incredible son living on the streets of New York. I have a warrant out for his arrest, and there's no way to get him home. He talks to the police in New York, and he gives them a phony name, and, and he goes out and helps kids on the street with them. Margaret, you are a social worker for 20 years. <laughs> Analyze it. What do you do? These are kids that, and families that we have failed long before they ever hit the streets. I mean, we are not a society that has paid a whole, enough attention to our kids. I mean, in our city, we're having trouble getting playgrounds for kids to play in. So the problem, I'm sure, of your child began long before he actually ran. Uh, we need more tutoring programs. We need uh, job training programs. We need a whole range Do of family support services. Do we even know services. what we need? I mean, to say that this is a society that hasn't paid a lot of attention to its kids, I know you'd find an argument from, from a vast number of people on that. I think this society pays a tremendous amount of attention to its kids. Well, I think it's a society that gives a lot of lip service to, to its kids, and every politician kisses babies. And so you think that kids are a number one priority in this society, but they're not. If you look at actually where we're spending our money, it's not on our kids. And you look at what our national, state, and local priorities are, it, it's, not, it's not the kids. And uh, this child, like all the children who run away, have a whole range of needs we don't even begin to meet. And if we can meet them before they run away, of course we're better off. Okay. Ian and KC, you hear a mother talking about a runaway son, a case similar to both of your cases. Does it make any impression? Does it, does it make you, uh, I don't know, four years is a long time to be away from home? Well, <clears throat> let me, I think people have gotten that wrong. It's been on and off, but it's mostly been off. I've been, I mean, I live on the streets for a certain amount of time. I go home, and the first time I ran away, I didn't realize how much pain I was putting my parents through. And, um, but also they did not realize what I was going through and what I had to do to survive on the streets when I was gone. 
And the way I was brought up in my family, there's no gayness in the family. You were born straight, you are straight. And I didn't consider myself gay, but I was selling myself to another man. And so I didn't explain that to my parents, what I did. And they just said, you know, you had it easy, you weren't killed, you know, you weren't kidnapped. We didn't have to get you out of jail or anything like that. Um, and it just kept building up because I couldn't explain to them. And the frustration got so bad, I just ran again and again and again, and here I am. Casey? In my situation, I come from a real religious family. I'm a Mormon. And it's really hard because I've had, I, my problems started off in school, too. I was never in special ed, but I've always gotten bad grades. Um, other members of my family, they've always done much better. And I always felt like I wasn't good enough. And my parents always wanted to be something that I wasn't. And then I started going into group homes, and that's where my problem all started. Could you ever get back home? Do you think yeah, you could? Yeah, off and on since I was 14. Could I you think. now? Could I now? I just, um, I got picked up for prostitution three months ago. And the guy that got picked up with me, he was 19. They gave him a ticket and let him go. My mom and dad, <coughs> dad didn't want me at home. And I ended up doing two and a half months for just because I had nowhere to go. And do you want your son to come home if you find out that he's been engaged in this kind of thing? Um, yes, I know he has. And I worry about him all the time. And uh, I'd like to dress in your friends. <sighs> that I'm willing to bet that your parents really love you. Yeah, they do. And, uh, and I think one of the problems is that we don't create a, a structure for these kids. That if they don't want to do something, they know they can create an upset. And then, uh, so their parents can get upset, and we're human. So that they can say, well, I can't live here anymore, I've got to leave. And then they leave. And, uh... Ian? My problem was, um, I don't know if it, the, anything about your family or anything like that, but when I needed my space, when it was building up because I was doing my drugs, or because I was cutting school and my grades were bad, uh -huh. it was hard for me to go home and say, Mom, I got an F. I hit it, and I just built up in me because I couldn't express myself to my family. So why take the drugs? Because that was my way out, yeah. because I couldn't talk to my parents. And then when I went to my parents and I said, listen, I need some space, I need some time, let me just go spend the night at my friend's house. No, go in your room. That's your own space. That's yeah. not good enough. You need to be out. You need to just be free. And instead of saying, well, screw you. If you're not going to let me get my space, I'm going to go get my own space. If you had mm -hmm. said, okay, go out for a couple of hours and then come back. Just let us know where you're going and everything like that. I wouldn't have been so tempted to run away. I would have calmed down, gone back inside, and tried to explain. But it was always no, go to your room. Or it ended up in a big fight. Maybe so. But are you willing to look at... Are you do take drugs now? No. No. Good. Um, it was hard to quit, believe me. Let's try I, to talk about solutions a little bit at this point. Wayne Smith, you've been <laughs> dealing with a lot of these kids for a long time. Does, does, these kind of problems seem to be problems that all kids have, or a lot of kids have, and yet this group seems to turn to prostitution, whereas most kids don't. What works? What would, would end this? Well, one of the things I was going to bring up is the drug problem. I think we've kind of evaded that. And uh, when you're working with kids, the unusual would be a kid not taking drugs. Uh, the speed out there on Polk Street, any other given area, is killing some very, very young kids. Paul yeah. Seidler. Yeah, I think we've heard a lot of folks here talking about what everybody else should be doing, what I haven't been doing, or whatever. And I think what we need to look at in a real, real sense is, you know, what can I do as an individual to solve this problem? Because I think the real basis here is preventing the problem before it gets out on the street. The police can't correct it once it's out there. But I think collectively, if we look for solutions before they get out on the street, we might find something. Greg Day. I, I just want to say the real issue here is economics. All these young people in this documentary have said we are prostituting ourselves so that we can buy a hotel room and have food, so that we can be independent adults and take care of ourselves because we don't trust adults and we've had a negative experience with adults. I think that, uh, that Ian and some, some of the youth that we see on the street are fortunate to have parents who are concerned. The real tragedy is that a majority of the youth that we see at the Larkin Street Youth Center have, are throwaways. Their parents are not interested in working with them or feel that they can no longer work with them. 
we call them up, they hang up on the phone. Also, we have a large part of that throwaway population are gay and lesbian youth whose parents cannot deal with their emerging sexual identity and who throw them out of the home. Sometimes we are successful in bringing that family back together, but I think this points out that parents' expectations about youth, some parents' expectations about youth, are not always uh, reasonable either, and need that parents, both parents and youth, need to work together. So, so the long-term solutions seem to be just that, pretty hard to achieve in long term. In the short term, to sum up briefly, is it going to take more resources from the city and maybe the state to, to do something to, to make more beds available so, so at least you can alleviate the problem on a temporary basis? I think the immediate need, and I think if a program is brought forth, it would easily be funded uh, from the city, is to get the basic human needs of food, shelter, and medical care to anyone who needs it in the city. It's not an easy undertaking. Uh, even to feed people, from, stop adults from eating out of garbage cans is not an easy undertaking in our city. Is it popular? Uh, it's not popular, but it's not easy even when you do have the will to do it. And the mayor is willing and the board is willing. And it's taken us almost four years even to get a decent adult homeless program started. I think it's very important for people to know that the city does have a plan for serving homeless kids. It was a year in the making. It involved input from kids, from service providers, from parents, and the plan has not been implemented, and that is the, a problem of resources. And so any optimism that this is going to change any way that uh, hasn't changed in the last 10 years? It seems to have gotten worse. Again, I, I don't think that the problems, I did Paul's job for five years, was an inspector in the Juvenile Bureau, and I guess things have been going on for 20 years. I think when we're looking at uh, three or four hundred thousand dollars coming in for a model demo program for San Francisco and L.A., uh, I think that you'll see some positive movement in, within San Francisco within the next 18 months. More than, a lot's being done right now. I think the agencies serving these young people are fantastic. Okay, I think on that note, we're going to cut it off. Uh, Ms. Brodkin and Mr. Sarsfield, and to our studio audience, thanks to all of you for joining us. If you have a comment about tonight's Express, write to us at Express 508th Street, San Francisco, 94103. That's 508th Street, San Francisco, 94103. And that's our show for tonight. Two weeks from tonight, Express presents a look at the newest nuclear tests being conducted by the U.S., and we'll talk to experts about the merits of a comprehensive test ban treaty. That's June 11th on Express. Thanks for watching. For KQED, I'm Spencer Michaels. Good night. The Larkin Street Youth Center, which served many runaway youths, was destroyed by fire on May 21st. The fire killed the center's custodian. For more information about the Larkin Street Youth Center's efforts to reopen, call 673-0915 or write to Larkin Street Youth Center Disaster Fund, 1044 Larkin Street, San Francisco 94109.